energy underpins human economies. But to see that, we first have to see how energy underpins life. Every single thing in the universe requires an energy potential to move, live, or accomplish things. The original factories are plants in nature. Energy for plants is coming from photosynthesis, the famous process where nature turns sunlight into glucose, which in turn provides the energy needed to assemble new branches, leaves, and flowers from the molecules available in air and soil, like carbon and phosphorus. As we'll see later, this same process of accessing and using an energy input to convert materials into useful work and products exists in the factories of our body or in the industrial factories of the modern human economy. Everything we do first requires an energy input. There are trophic pyramids in nature. Underpinning each level of this energy pyramid is energy from the sun. Sun to plants, plants to herbivores, herbivores to carnivores. At each higher level, there's an energy conversion in which approximately 90% of the energy is lost. And the biomass at the top is a tiny fraction of the original energy at the bottom of the pyramid, but the sun underpins everything. Thus, the productivity of an ecosystem on Earth is correlated to how much sunlight it was able to degrade and turn into biomass. We're going to get to the relationship between energy and technology, like Fortnite, between energy and financial markets, and between energy and social movements, like what's currently happening in France. But first we have to understand the basics. To organisms in nature, all this energy isn't free. Yes, the sun starts a trophic cascade that grows plants and from that base, all other organisms get their food. But every movement and effort in nature also requires energy. Biologists study something called optimal foraging behavior, which measures how much time and energy organisms expend in order to obtain their meals. Animals that have a high surplus of Calories gained less calories expended have survival and reproductive advantages. For example, if you were a trout, you wouldn't randomly hang out in this river. The place highlighted by the yellow arrow would have two big biologic advantages. Number one, you could hang out where you wouldn't have to spend much energy swimming. And number two, you'd be presented with lots of calorie-containing bugs and food that float down the rapids and would be easy for you to just reach out and grab. This relationship of investing a little and trying to get a lot is ubiquitous in nature. Would you believe that the origins of capitalism are not in England or Amsterdam, but in the rivers, savannas, and forests? Stay with me. Each time a cheetah chases an antelope, there's a certain amount of energy expenditure from a limited bank account. It might take 10 or 15 attempts before the cheetah finally cashes in on the caloric payoff a large gazelle. So organisms that have outsized energy income relative to their energy expense have had evolutionary advantages. All else being equal, a cheetah chasing and eating an antelope will then have more energy in the coming days and weeks for survival and reproduction than had it chased a rabbit or a mouse. This is all formalized by a concept called energy return on energy investment. And this relationship is ubiquitous in nature. The energy expended for individuals or for tribes has a large correlation with their survival and success. Humans and all human created systems are subject to the same energy limits as any living system. Large returns mean less work and more free time or other options other than hunting and gathering for food. About 12,000 years ago, we morphed from hunter gatherers into stationary bands which grew to villages and eventually nation-states. For the first time, these tribes of our ancestors possessed an energy surplus that we couldn't eat immediately in the form of storable, tradable, grain and agricultural surplus. The existence of this surplus allowed some members of society to do jobs unrelated to agriculture. It doesn't seem like it, but this would be the critical shift in human behavior, organization, lifestyles, and impact. Agriculture channeled more food energy through human societies. If you fast forward a few thousand years, we see surplus energy directed towards non-basic needs. For example, approximately 100,000 human slaves over a 20-year period to quarry, shape, and move 6 million tons of stone ended up with the Great Pyramids of Giza in Egypt. 
Creative use of technology in the form of levers, pulleys, sleds, and the like was necessary and important to this accomplishment, but without the caloric expenditures needed to power human muscle generated from the rest of the surplus of their society, these structures could never have been built. The last millennia, humans expanded around the globe, improving farming techniques and technology and increasing the surplus that we amass from the sun, soil, water, and the land. But we started to run into limits in the 18th century. We were running out of ways to generate the surplus for the wants and needs of so many people from the biomass alone. It was around then we puzzled out how to access the dense energy in fossil carbon and hydrocarbons. Crude oil and its cousins, natural gas and coal, are ancient solar productivity via dead and condensed living organisms that lived between five and 300 million years ago that we pull out of the ground today and add to the human ecosystem, effectively by starting to tap the land vertically as well as horizontally, we added armies of cheap workers to human economies. The story of the benefits these armies provide for us is still not widely understood or appreciated. But as we'll see in the upcoming videos, what they do for us is indistinguishable from magic on any human time scale.